Westminster is something I have to do as part of advocacy and in hopefully influencing policy and over 20 years there are very few politicians that have managed to inspire me. The person I'm introducing you to is one of those individuals that I have much in common with, namely our love of sport. The speaker is and could have been a world beater in sport, his particular sport being tennis. He also remarkably is a coach, that's something I found out. But more importantly, he is passionately an agent of change and having one of the highest offices of the state. And in this land, I thought it was absolutely critical if I could get him to come and meet you, knowing how difficult it would be for you to go and meet him. So it is with immense pleasure and with a most grateful welcome that I introduce to you the Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burke. Chair, Professor Hall, Mrs. Walker, colleagues, students, thank you for coming to what is a magnificent institution and I think a very suitable setting for what should be a forward-looking kind of discussion. An institution dedicated not just to media but to communication, to the concept of the use of new technology, to journalism, and all that goes with it. It's a rather exciting and dynamic looking building. I gather there's a lot more of it than what we're sitting in and experiencing at the moment. And I wish Professor Hall and his colleagues Godspeed in taking forward their work. It's a delight to meet up again with Jeff and Janice, who are amongst what I call life's enthusiasts. That is to say, they've got a passion for something and they're determined to channel that passion and transmit it to other people. Their passion for sport, their passion for teamwork, their passion for the triumph of individuals over adversity, and their passion, I think, also for more widely, through sport and perhaps by other means, trying to encourage young people to engage with the communities of which they are part. Before I say anything remotely serious about what I, as Speaker of the Commons, do, I cannot come to the northwest of England in this of all weeks and neglect to say something about the truly horrific event that has hit the Northwest in the last few days. The overwhelming likelihood is that none of us here present knew officers Nicola Hughes or Fiona Bowe, that those were dedicated police officers serving their community, trying to do, and doubtless overwhelmingly, day to day, week after week, month after month, year after year, succeeding in doing the right thing by the citizens of Manchester. And tragically and scandalously, they've lost their lives this week going about their business, trying to do good and to protect, only to have their lives prematurely cut short by what surely must rank as an act of evil. So we should, in thinking about ourselves 
and what we're trying to do for the future, think for a moment of them, of their loved ones, of their friends, of their neighbours, of people who knew and care for them. And we just hope that the future is, is rather better than the present, as of these sorts of wanton acts of despicable and cowardly violence don't keep recurring. As Jeff said, we know each other through sport. He is, of course, a world champion. He's a serious karate champion. He's linked up with others distinguished in the field of sport, including distinguished Paralympians. And Janice, Jeff's wife and partner in life, is a champion sportswoman as well. And I admire the way they're trying to encourage other people to be interested in sport. I ought to say the avoidance of doubt students that they were infinitely better at their sport than I ever was at mine. But I did enjoy learning to play tennis. Now I know tennis has got rather a middle class, poshish image. And I think it's got quite a lot to do to challenge and tackle that. And I'd love to see more and more and more kids in state schools, just as they can play football and netball and sometimes basketball and very occasionally rugby and periodically cricket. I'd like to see more and more young people in school have the chance to play tennis. Because one person in Britain recently who's increased the chances that young people from ordinary families might think about picking up a tennis racket, I think it must be Andy Murray, who in a way, he sort of defies the stereotype. He's not a posh English boy. In fact, he's not an English boy at all. He's a Scots boy, and he's not posh. He doesn't come from a privileged background. He does come from a background with a mother who was passionate about tennis, and a tennis coach who helped. But there is a guy, I know Judy Murray a bit. I can't claim to know Andy Murray. But there's a guy who's just got terrific talent, and has worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and trained and trained and trained and trained and trained to get to the highest level he can. And in case you don't know, well, let me ask you, who knows? Who can tell me what has Andy Murray won recently? Yes. Sorry? Brilliant. Well done. What's your name? Jack. Jack's got it in one. He won the US Open Championship, which is one of the biggest tournaments in the world, one of the four big titles around the world, and Andy Murray was once in the final of that tournament four years ago and lost, and this year he won. Um, he won in a very, very hard fought match that took five hours, so that was a terrific achievement. Can anybody think of anything else, because you meet in the aftermath of the big event, do you think of anything else that Andy Murray has won this year? Let me take, if I may, a young girl. Yes. He won the Olympic gold medal in singles. You're quite right. And to win that Olympic gold medal, he had to beat the number two player in the world, Novak Djokovic. And then in the final, he had to beat the current world number one, Roger Federer. And he beat both of them. And in fact, this occasion he beat them both pretty comprehensively. So I think we ought to start this session by giving a great British young sportsman a big round of applause. <laughs> now, you might not have it in you to be an Andy Murray or to be a top soccer star or a top footballer or a top cricketer. You might, and if you have, good luck to you. But even if you haven't, I hope you think there's something about sport that is worth doing. Think of the things about sport that are worth doing. Why is sport worth doing? Can you think of something that's good about playing sport? You have fun. That's a good starting reason. It's fun. Can anybody think of another reason? Yes. It's good exercise, so it's good for your health. A third reason? Keeps you fit, that's sort of part of the health agenda, that's right. What about you? Helps you with the future, it does help you with the future. If it's an individual sport, like tennis, or 
swimming, then it encourages you to work incredibly hard and always seek to do just that better, perhaps improve on your best performance. If it's a team sport, then of course there are issues, aren't there, of teamwork and cooperation and trying to work out with your colleagues a plan and sticking to it and using your own skills but drawing on the skills of other people as well. So that idea of putting yourself out for the other person, a bit of extra effort, backing up one of your colleagues if your colleague is struggling, doing things with some team spirit is pretty important. So I hope that you'll feel that's worthwhile. And if you think of sport in one other way, you can see what a terrific boon, what a very positive thing it is for people who perhaps are struggling in other ways to look at sport as an opportunity for all of those things. A bit of exercise and good health, a bit of fun, bit of comradeship, or to use a really old-fashioned word that Jeff and I probably use, but you probably don't. Sport is an opportunity for what I call good fellowship. People mixing and interacting, getting the best out of each other in a way that maybe they don't do in the rest of the day. So for all of those reasons, I think sport's a great thing, and we want to see much more of it. Now, I'm conscious that you will very likely have, as part of your mission today, questions in your mind. So I'm going to say to you something pretty brief about the work that I do. As Jeff says, I'm the speaker of the House of Commons. The 157th speaker, as it happens, or 156 people before me who held this role, there will be a great many after me. In case you don't know, I'll tell you the following three things about my work as speaker. First of all, I'm the referee. So if you're trying to work out, well, what on earth does this chap do who's talking at us today? We don't watch parliamentary television. Who ever watches parliament on television? Hardly anybody. Okay, a couple of adults, very few youngsters. You know who the Prime Minister is, or you know what he does, but you almost certainly don't know anything about what I do. So the first point I want to make to you is that the speaker in Parliament is the referee, or if you were a tennis player, the umpire, or if you play cricket, I'm the umpire. So I'm not playing for one team or the other. I used to be a Conservative MP, and I'm still a Member of Parliament representing an area in South of England called Buckingham. But I don't now sit as a party MP, speaking and voting for a party, because I was elected three years ago as the Speaker. And that means that I have to sit in the chair in the centre of Parliament, in the chamber, and I have to keep order, like a referee does in a football match, or maybe like a head teacher in school. I'm encouraging people to take part, to ask their questions, make their speeches, get their points across. And I have to try to cut down on the number of people excluded altogether as a result of bad behaviour i.e. I want to try to work with call women as well as men. And I hope the boys won't mind when I say this, or indeed some of your male teachers, I'm sure the female teachers won't mind, but the simple fact is that the women on the whole in Parliament are better behaved. They make less noise and they're not as inclined to shout and scream and draw attention to themselves. And therefore it's very important that I don't forget about them and that they don't lose out. So I'm very conscious of the gender balance, trying to ensure it's a fair representation of women speaking as well as men. So that's my first role. Secondly, I'm trying to improve the operation of Parliament and make it a bit livelier. And I'm trying to ensure that the government, the ministers running the country, including the Prime Minister, have to answer to Parliament for what they do. So I often demand that they come and answer questions urgently on matters that have suddenly arisen. And I do do this on a much bigger scale than used to do that. But what I do say is that the government must explain its policies in Parliament, not just to the media, but in Parliament. And sometimes ministers in all governments prefer to avoid doing that. They like just having a nice soft interview with a friendly journalist 
they might not want to come to Parliament and to explain themselves and answer questions for an hour. And part of the job of the Speaker is to stand up for the rights of Parliament, even when it sometimes upsets the government. So sometimes I probably, well I know, I do irritate ministers because they don't want to have to come into Parliament and change their diary and short notice and answer questions for an hour. And I say, well, the Secretary of State must come to the House to explain this, and I will go. Can anybody tell me what job does Martin Gove have? <laughs> Education yeah. Secretary. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Well, Mr. Gove phoned me up last Sunday to say that he was asking my advice. His plans to reform exams have been leaked to the newspapers. There have been what he described as some loose talk from within his department, and stories about what he was planning have got into the newspapers. And he said, Mr. Speaker, I ask your advice. I was going to come to Parliament on Tuesday to announce my plans, but I want to know, do you think I should come earlier? Should I come on Monday instead? It will mean changing all my diary notes. I said, well, you ask myself and aim high. Don't let anybody tell you that it can't be done, or you're not good enough, or it won't happen. Have a go, because I described you at the start of my talk a sportsman who admittedly had a very focused and motivated mother, but who didn't come from some special privileged background, he didn't have no good money or go to a posh school or anything like that, but he believed he could be a champion. And he ended up a champion. I wasn't a champion, I wasn't good enough. But I did want to go into public service, I wanted to go into Parliament. And I went to an ordinary state school, and I don't come from some privileged background, but I believe that I have perhaps the capacity to serve in my chosen field in politics, and that's what I'm proud to be doing. So I wouldn't want you to think that there are avenues closed off to you, because there are. If you want to work hard and use your skills and learn all the time from people who can help you, there's no reason why you shouldn't achieve your ambition. That is what I think you'll have the confidence and determination to do. You can be very patient in queuing up to be photographed and then listening to the briefing you had beforehand. And now for the last 15 or 20 minutes of hearing me, thank you for your interest. You'll be very relieved to know that my little speech is over, but I hope that your questions and comments are about to be It's over to you now. You've heard much from us. The speaker will now answer any questions that you feel applicable to his office of state. I know you have a lot of them, so time's both our friend and our enemy. So, if anyone would like to start. Good. That's a very good question, because I have a, an allegiance. What's your name? Uh, Robert. Robert. Because I have an allegiance to the Conservative Party and an area, constituency, to represent, do I ever find it difficult to remain impartial? I don't find it difficult to remain impartial. I say that for two reasons. One, I would say not that I have an allegiance, the Conservative Party, but that I had past tense an allegiance to the Conservative Party. In our system, in Britain, the Speaker is expected to give up party membership on becoming Speaker, and on the day I was elected Speaker, which was June 22nd, 2009, that night, I wrote to the Chairman of the Conservative Party to resign my membership. I still sit in Parliament, and at the election I have to stand as the Speaker, seeking re-election to Parliament. And by convention, the major parties don't stand against the Speaker. They can, but they don't. Why? Well, because they want the Speaker to be re-elected. So, no disrespect to my former party, but I didn't feel I had any allegiance to them now at all. It's very important that I am impartial between Conservative and Labour and the Democrat. I mean, can you please everybody? No. Can you satisfy everybody that you're behaving impartially. Not really, because we're in a, 
a competitive environment, yeah, where people have strong things have a hand up and to go. Somebody else had a hand up. Okay, when you did, it's now gone quiet. But don't be shy, please do. It's a very British thing, people don't like going first, please. Um, how does it feel to boss MPs and the MPs and the How does it feel to boss MPs and the Prime Minister around? <laughs> well, I don't get any sort of pick up it. I mean, I enjoy chairing in the chamber. Okay? I love Parliament, I believe in democracy and the right of free expression. People standing up for what they believe and standing up for people in their area. So if you ask me, do I get a sort of great kick out of telling people off? I don't. I genuinely don't. It's that Students, as you will appreciate, the Prime Minister is the biggest single figure, the most important figure in our political system. And of course I respect Prime Minister Cameron, partly because of the very high office that he holds, the responsibilities he has, and partly because I've known him for 25 years, long before we were in Parliament together, we were in the Conservative Parliament together, and he is a very capable guy, he's a clever chap with a lot of ability. So of course I respect him, I always treat him with courtesy. But we have different jobs. His job is to run the country, but my job is to be in charge of good order in the house. And so we no disrespect to the Prime Minister. I don't say I get a great kick out of it, but he has to play by the rules as well. So if now and again he does something that's a little bit out of order, then I'm afraid I have to say so. Occasionally, and I've done it to him, but also to Gordon Brown, they've been a bit cheeky at question time. They've started doing something they're not supposed to do. I suppose, I, I'm being rather greedy, you ask what is the best part of the job, and I'm being slightly greedy in saying that there are two things. I do chair a thing called the House of Commons Commission, okay, which is like the board of Parliament, a bit like the board of a university or a company. It's important work, but it doesn't thrill me. I do it, I'm very happy to do it, I don't find it misery making or anything, but it's not particularly stimulating. The two bits I enjoy most are chairing in the chamber and hearing my colleagues speak and making sure there's a fair debate. So at least I can say to myself, well, I did my best. I got as many people to speak as possible. I got a good balance and I kept reasonable control. I enjoy that. But the other bit that I enjoy hugely is getting around the country and meeting people who are not perhaps part of the Parliament and talking to and his peace. What's the worst situation I've had to deal with during my time as speaker? Well, there have been a few things that are problematic. I would say that, I wouldn't say that there's been anything very complicated. We had an embarrassing incident, which was bad in the sense that I thought it reflected poorly on Parliament when Rupert Murdoch, who knows Rupert Murdoch? Who's Rupert Murdoch? Uh, the owner of B Sky B. Owner of B Sky B and News International and so on, News Corp. Yes, well Rupert Murdoch came and gave evidence to a committee last year and he was attacked by somebody with a foam pie in the face. Now, it's not that I hold any special brief for Rupert Murdoch, I felt very strongly in fact I pressed for him to be forced to give evidence to the committee, and he was obliged in the end to give evidence. I don't hold any special brief for him, but I do feel that if we're going to have witnesses, if we're going to insist on witnesses giving evidence, then they must be able to do so safely, whatever we think of them, or whatever you think of them. And he shouldn't have been physically attacked, and I was embarrassed that, in, if you like, a sort of breach of security meant that he was attacked in that way, and I did immediately commission a, an independent inquiry into how this man was able to get his boat pie through security, which shouldn't frankly have happened. So that was, I wouldn't say, a massive problem, but in the short term it was a bit embarrassing. I suppose if I'm self-critical, I would say probably my worst moment was when I had a, a sort of stand-up row with the government chief whip, who's a senior figure. The chief whip seemed to be in the news at the moment, but the current government chief whip is, is in the news today for other reasons. But the government chief whip, was a man called Patrick McLaughlin. And he was annoyed with a, a ruling I made one night. Why did I decide, decide to try to become speaker? The answer, I thought, this may sound very arrogant, I think it doesn't sound too arrogant, 
I thought I'd be good at it. I've always been passionate about Parliament, debate, argument, fair play in Parliament, everybody having a chance to have their say, speaking their mind. I've always been rather outspoken myself. And the truth of the matter is that I didn't want to be a member of the government. I didn't want to be a minister, you know, like education minister or health minister. And partly because I had been quite a naughty boy over the years on my own side, in my own party, I knew that I wasn't likely to be asked to be a minister. I didn't think the Prime Minister, I didn't think David Cameron was ever going to offer me a job in government. So it was a combination of I didn't think I'd be asked, and I didn't think he wanted to be a minister anyway, but I felt that I wanted to do something in Parliament. And so I said to myself around sort of 2005, 2006, well, I said to my wife, I think if the chance comes, I'll have a go. And I decided that I'd have a go. And at the time the speakership came up, because the speaker had retired, resigned, the, the chief whip in my own party said to me, it just shows you should be very careful you know, what predictions you make about how other people are going to do. The chief whip said to me, John, you can stand the speaker, but you'll lose. And I said to him, well, we'll see, actually. You know, we'll see about that. You know, that's your view. I, I think I've got a chance of winning. And I intend to stand. And he said, I would advise you to do this. And I said, I'm very grateful for your advice that I decided to stand anyway. And fortunately, I felt I could win. And fortunately, I did. So do I have any regrets? No, I absolutely love the job. I have no plans to die tomorrow. But if I die tomorrow, I'll die happy, feeling well. At least I had a chance. And I've enjoyed it. That is a question that's completely foxed me. Do you know, I can't think of one that I've regarded as, you know, more ridiculous than quite a number of others. Some strange laws are proposed from time to time. You know, I can't honestly think of one. I sometimes, what are my favorite hobbies? Answer, playing tennis, badly, and watching tennis. Football, I fear I'm going to cause the most enormous offence in Salford by saying, oh, no. I'm an Arsenal fan. Oh, no. <laughs> Please understand me, I am from London, okay? My mother is from Yorkshire, Huddersfield, but I'm a London boy. And if you were brought up in North London, as I was, you tend to be either an Arsenal or a Tottenham fan. And I was an Arsenal fan from the age of eight. I've just bought season tickets for my self and my son, for one of my girls. I've got two, two season tickets. I'm letting my two boys share between them. And if when Jemima's old enough, if she wants to go as well, then I'll buy her a ticket. But anyway, so tennis and football, swimming to try to keep fit. I'm a lousy swimmer, but I swim a lot to try to keep reasonably fit. And apart from that, I'm afraid I basically read a lot. I know it's a bit solitary, but I like reading novels and biographies, books about people's lives. My favourite modern author, in case any of you are familiar with her work, I'm a great fan of the work of Sarah Waters. Is there anybody, anybody here studying literature? Anybody ever read a novel by Sarah Waters? Okay, well, Sarah Waters is a, a very good modern novelist who's written a number of very, very skilled novels and I admire very much. Two more, more, two more questions. Okay, two, two more. Okay, right. And have you asked one? Yeah. You've already asked. Would you mind if I take something you have? What about your good self? Good question. Am I allowed to have my own views and opinions about matters sort of outside Parliament? Well, I can, but I ought to be a bit careful about expressing them if they're on controversial matters. I mean, I wouldn't express a view about David Cameron versus Ed Miliband, or whether I agree with George Osborne's policies on the economy or Ed Ball's policies, because that's very toxic, controversial territory. So I'm a bit careful. I express some views to constituents if they ask me. If they say to me, you know, what do you think about, you know, particular piece of legislation I might I might I probably would tell them but I would be careful about avoiding party political observations. Um, yeah. oh, go on. Let's see if we can take a couple more. Go on. Yeah. No, I only voted as a tie. It's not been a tie you know, draw 
since I became speaker. And if I found there was a tie, then the speaker has to vote to allow for more debate. So I wouldn't, if the government piece of legislation is at its last stage, yeah, it's a question of does it become law or doesn't it? And if it's a tie, I don't know, because if the government can't get a majority of this piece of legislation, it's not my job to do it for them. One last question. What about the young man there? Yes, please. If I weren't speaker, what would I like to do? Well, I guess I'd like to be a tennis commentator. I'd like to commentate on sport. I've often thought I'd like to have some link, if I weren't in politics, I'd like to have some link with higher education, to be honest. I, I'm the first person in my family who had the chance to go to university. I spent three very happy years at the University of Essex, where I had fabulous tutors, some of whom Martin Hall will probably know. Mangle Professor Anthony King was a wonderful tutor. And I quite like one day to do something again in the field of higher education. You've been very patient. I, my only sadness is the time, as Jeff says, is always both our friend and our enemy. And I fear, go on, last one. <laughs> fitting conclusion, Jeff, to our proceedings. And the answer is I'd love you to have the facilities you want. And, and if I can make one suggestion, it's a delight to be here in Salford. Get your MP involved. Get your local MP involved in helping. I know she can't be here today, but I think I'm right in saying we're in Hazel Blear's constituency. So I'd just like if I may to round up by saying that there are members of parliament in all parties that I respect for the hard work they do, and I know Hazel well, and I'm a big fan of hers, and who you vote for when you're old enough, it's up to you, I'm not supporting her against other candidates, but just say, just to say that Hazel has been pursuing an initiative in Parliament to give people the chance to work in Parliament who wouldn't otherwise have the chance, people from quite disadvantaged backgrounds, it's a yep. speaker's parliamentary placement scheme the people post-school, post-education, have the chance to work for a year in Parliament. And it's called the Speaker's Scheme, but the person who drove the scheme on my behalf was Hazel Bill, more than anybody else. So she's really committed to trying to improve opportunity for young people. And my advice to you, if I may, is get in touch with Hazel, get your school to get in touch with Hazel, and try to work out a campaign, a plan, to get the facility Thank you. Okay. The versatility of a speaker, as you said, to the 2012 Olympics and Paralympic Games is what the legacy would be in inspiring a generation. That strap line of the Games has now become real. And at the new charge we felt with a legacy manifesto of a year ago, it was only right and proper that you have your say and your voice in what questions to be placed on the people who make the decisions as to what that legacy might well indeed be. School sport and how it can enhance the school experience is one of the key legacy objectives. So your questions now will be informed by a panel with the speaker or the recipient of questions now chairing the questions that are posed. The first thing I would ask of you is that you stand and that you very confidently read out your question because that's the most important thing in democracy, being heard. It's what I was to learn and I didn't have the confidence I have now back then. But please get your, con your questions clearly communicated, who you represent and what you stand for. I'm going to now introduce my panel. Um, Professor Hall you know, but he also has a sporting interest. What is your sporting interest? <laughs> you watch it. You just made that up. No, I didn't. We've talked sport. That's why you've got me here. I, I run. All South Africans love their sport. Don't let me bluff you. 
<laughs> Sport is part of their very <laughs> run. Very senior no, 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 no. run. <laughs> Jeanette Walker is the head teacher of Malbank um, Secondary in College. Is that the right term? Right. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with Malbank. They're one of the most enthused schools that embrace the Olympic and Paralympic ideals. And our relationship is ongoing, but more importantly, she has arts as her passion and was no mean performer herself. My next guest is a special one because there are very few sportsmen or women who actually can still do what they say on the can. Simon Jackson, MBE, is a fellow martial artist but is a Paralympian multi gold medalist. He came in quietly, but I'd like you to welcome him now because he's yeah. a special person. Yeah. More importantly, Simon works with some of the most disaffected young people, those who are no longer at school, or have been excluded or expelled from school, or are now no longer enjoying what you enjoy, a wholesome education. But he is the epitome of a youth charter ambassador. So that's enough from me. Your questions will hopefully, by way of what you've submitted a few days ago and up to last night, be quite interesting and challenging. And um, Mr. Burke will I'd no doubt have an interesting ability of passing the questions to whom you feel you feel them. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Well students, I hope you're in the mood. You've got a really dynamic panel who know what they're about. And I think the first question, if I understand correctly, because I've got my brief, is from Adam Woolley of Bolton School. Adam, would you care to deliver your question? Of course. Uh, if I may address everyone on the panel. Please. Um, in these, uh, in this economic climate of, uh, at worst, continuing deterioration, or at best, uh, economic stasis, um, how is the government justified in increasing its funding uh, of the British Olympic team for Rio 2016? Okay, I'm going to ask Jeff to have the first question. <laughs> 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 As a former gold medalist, it was always my wish that we'd be fully funded and resourced in order to win the medals and do Britain proud. <clears throat> I always also felt that in order to keep us hungry, focused, mean and angry, is that we should always have to hunt for some of that funding. And I come from the generation of the 80s. It was a very medal time. And sports right across the board, from Olympic to non-Olympic, minority sports, which I always hated, to the high profile sports. I do have a view, and my only support of such a large amount of money being invested in an extraordinary team effort, such as Team GB and Paralympic GB were able to achieve, is if it has a direct consequence, impact, and contribution to the inspiration of young people in their schools, out of their schools, and as a nation as a whole. I do not think the policy has been properly coordinated yet, but I would have suggested if half a billion is being invested in our competitors, whereas the campaign that suggested there should be at least three billion invested in how we participate once people, young people, want to participate in sport. Okay, thank you. That's, I think, pretty clear. And in that sense, I hope for the debate, helpful. Jeanette, what do you make of it? I agree with Jeff. Um, I think one of the things about the Olympics and the Paralympics that you can't put a price on was the feel-good factor that hit all of us. Um, I was in America uh, on the day of the opening ceremony and it was very interesting to see their perspective of us and how they were wowed uh, in awe of us being able to put on a games of that scale and that efficiency and, and so impressive. So I think that although it sounds like a lot of money we're investing in athletes, we're actually investing in a range of other things that come as consequences of us doing well in those games, about other countries believing in us and about the inspiration of people being back at home. Okay, thank you. It's also very succinct. If ministers were as good at answering questions so succinctly <laughs> in Parliament, we'd make quicker progress. Simon. Uh, can I stand up? Yes, please yeah. do. Yeah. Who watched more Farrah? Okay. For more Farrah to win, to win what he won, he need to have funding. Okay. The, the athletes need to train full time 
Okay, like Jeff said, I'm a I'm a, an athlete of the eighties as well. I know it's hard to believe because I don't look twenty, but I am. <laughs> but I had no funding. My mum sat over there, and my dad, who passed away seven weeks ago, he took me everywhere. Okay, so it was tough for me to become a Paralympic champion. But you need to have this funding to create the champions. Now I think what should be done to spend the money correctly is the athletes who get funded by the lottery, which I've been funded when I was competing for 20 years, you should then be made to go into schools and give something back. Not for a massive fee, okay, because athletes charge quite a big fee to go into schools now. I'm cheap, aren't you? <laughs> Very. But they should be made to, to give something back. And you have to have the funding to create the more farrers, which will then inspire you guys to put on some running shoes, a judo suit, or whatever sport it is. And then you'll start taking part in sport. So they should be made when they sign up for the lottery funding to give something back to the community and the schools. Thank you, Simon, very much indeed. Martin, <coughs> Professor Martin Hall. Um, let me try a different angle. I think what you're asking in your question, Adam, is um, how does the government make choices when the money's not there? Uh, and how does it justify spending money on sport when it can't spend money, for example, on the National Health Service uh, and other sorts of priorities? Um, for me, I think if you are in the middle of a recession, as we are in the middle of a recession, you can't climb out of it unless a number of things are achieved. And some of the, one of those things is innovation, another is enterprise, another is leadership, and another one is international links. So I think from the point of view of hard economics, the investment in the Olympics makes a huge amount of sense because it drives innovation, it drives economic opportunities um, in the middle of a recession. So it gives that sort of return. Thank you. I think that... Does anybody want to come in on this at all? Has anybody got a particular additional point, or do you feel that the panel has answered to your satisfaction? I'll take that as meaning that at this stage, at this early point in our proceedings, you are content. That is a vote of confidence in the quality and straightforwardness of our panel. And we'll move, if I may say so, to our next question, which is from Nick Brown of Sale High School. Nick, please. Um, I'd like to address this uh, question to the whole of the panel. Um, why do you think the printed media in the UK have portrayed the Paralympics in the London 2012 Games as lesser in importance compared to the Olympics? That's a very clear <laughs> question. Yeah, it's got to be... It's got to first of not it? <laughs> OK, then who watched the Paralympics uh, three weeks ago? Right, name me some Paralympians then. David Weir? Who? Oscar Pistorius, Ellie Simmons, Simmons. Johnny, Peacock. Johnny Peacock, any more? Anna, yeah, Alan Cockcroft, any more? Anna Cockcroft, sorry. Right, before the 2012 Games, I guarantee nobody here would be able to name a Paralympian, apart from Tanny Gray. Okay, so as I agree that the, the, the Paralympics are still, in some circumstances, not on a par in some people's eyes as the Olympics, not my eyes. The Olympics are a warm-up for the Paralympics, in my eyes, okay? It's a damn sight better than it was 20 years ago. Because I guarantee that nobody would have been able to name any Paralympians. So, yet, yeah, sometimes in the press, the first thing that they talk about is this, the back story, we call it. How they've become disabled. Okay, mine's boring. I was born like this. Okay, I was born with bad eyes. But we've got a lot of um, servicemen and now in the Paralympics who've got stories to tell. Now I agree that sometimes the press shouldn't, that shouldn't be the first thing that they focus on. It should be that they're a world-class athlete. But some of these backstories are very interesting. So I sort of disagree with you that the press have made it a lesser event than the Olympics. Because I've been in five Paralympic Games and this, as a press standpoint, has been the best Paralympics we've ever had. And if you ask any Paralympian who competed, I was, I was lucky to go to London and work for Channel 4, and it was an immense thing to go to. Those crowds were going to watch sport. And I think, that, like you said, a little bit, the press were a little bit uh, lesser than the Olympics, but it's, the, the, the gap is definitely coming a lot closer. So from my point of view, I think it's been a very positive um, Paralympic game.
Okay. Martin. I mean, I haven't got much to add to that, except that I think that um, as a result of the press coverage this time, the Paralympics won't be the same again. Okay, that's also very clear. Jeanette? I'd, I'd like to see the Paralympics on the BBC, though. Um, if the BBC really is the top of the tree broadcasting, if you put the Olympics on one channel and the Paralympics on another, then I think the Paralympics stands alone without advertising and should be on the BBC. Okay. Can, can, I, can I, I? Please, Simon. Is okay. Um, I agree with you, and I disagree with you as well, <laughs> because I, I think that I think it, it's a sort of a shame on the BBC to be honest with you that they didn't they didn't bid enough money to get the Paralympics. Um, but Channel Four, it was a sort of a, a competition between Channel Four and the BBC, wasn't it? They, they, Channel Four threw everything they had at the Paralympics, and I think. The adverts were a pain because you sort of got an event and then you go into an ad break and stuff like that. But I think the actual coverage that Channel 4 did was, was excellent. Um, when have the Paralympics ever been on from half past seven in the morning till 11 o'clock at night, non-stop? You've never seen that. When I used to compete, I got an hour, not on my own, obviously. I probably got an hour of highlights every day. So I, I think I'd like to see it on the BBC, but the BBC have got a lot to live up to from what the job Channel 4 did. I think they did a fantastic job. Thank you. Jeff? I was fortunate enough to go to the Paralympic opening ceremony and it was one of my truly enjoyable sporting experiences. To see not only the Paralympic athletes but 80,000 people crammed into the stadium watching performers, artists, support crew who all were supposed to be disabled performing to such high levels of excellence it truly took your breath away. The spirit, the themes that they had by way of education, the sciences, Professor Stephen Hawkins, who actually magically took everybody through an experience and I think set the tone for what will be a Paralympic Games that is now an equal and is seen as equal as the people who participated and watching the people of disability with that label that is stereotypically given. With pride and without the fear, I remember one young boy in a wheelchair saying he didn't feel as though people were staring at him anymore. And just to hear that and watching parents taking their families, not feeling in any way they've been stigmatized, was truly something that will stay with me. And my ultimate memory, watching a blind long jumper. <laughs> For anyone who wants to even consider walking 10 meters, will give you a feel of why I certainly feel they are the supreme athletes, they are the supreme sports people, and they are the supreme reflections of what can be overcome in life at first. Yeah. Thank you, panel, for those answers. Let's move on now to Isabel Sharma from Malbank School and Sixth Form College for her question. Where are you, Isabel? There you are. Good. <laughs> I'd like to adjust this to the whole panel also. Um, what could be done to establish links between schools in Rio and schools in GB to share our experiences of the Olympics and Paralympics. Okay, well, uh, tell you what, let's reverse the order. Let's give Martin a go. Um, I think we need to build links with schools generally, uh, um, not only for um, the Paralympics and the Olympics, but so we can have um, exchange of experience and opportunity all the time. So I think building international links with schools is a great idea. I think it's something universities can play a role with uh, in, in working with schools to build a possibility of those links to make them happen. And in fact, you're sitting in a building here which uh, has the possibility to do that. Um, we, can, uh, we can project on the screens behind me here in real time anywhere in the world uh, and really bring people uh, uh, together in a very sort of real sense to build those links. So I think getting partnerships together with different organizations to make those links work is the way to do it. Thank you. Jeff. We are a global community. Rio, believe it or not, have and are embracing technology, as Martin has outlined, in ways that has not been looked at in recent years in trying to bring together the continuing commitment to young people, social and human development of their young citizens. For example, they have exported 60,000 bursaries of young Brazilian citizens that they're having educated all over the world in the hope that one of the legacies will see them continue to see them, their nation building as a result of the legacy 
of hosting the Games become a reality. But I think the use of technology, I think what the British Council and others were doing during the 2012 Games build-up, and the links that were established are things that still need to be campaigned for. Please do not expect it to just happen. That is why campaigning, communicating, using the multimedia and social media, I think brings it to the attention of the decision makers. And it is certainly something I know that there are already some of the international community who work on delivering games already taking some of the brilliant ideas and experiences of 2012 as they help Brazil prepare for 2016. Jeff, you make the point that we're a global village. And in answer to an earlier question, Simon said he felt very strongly that as part of the deal, part of the sense that we owe something to our fellow citizens, Olympic or Paralympic champions should be obliged, required, to go into schools for nothing to impart some of their knowledge. On the same principle, you know, that we owe something not just to people in this country but around the world and to others who try to emulate what we've done on the Olympics, do you think that as part of this business of forging relationships, our Olympians and Paralympians, or some of them at any rate, should literally go out to Rio and communicate directly to the organisers of the next Games? I think for the last number of years, um, UK PLC, and this is trade missions, was, I had the privilege of going on three trade missions, promoting UK, UK PLC through sport, and I think it is a role that British sportsmen and women will play a more active role, especially with the success we've had, and Britain being seen as truly part of something exciting, new and futuristic as part of that global community. I think sportsmen and women now have to raise their bar in what they contribute locally in the communities in which they live, nationally as part of that collective effort, but more importantly internationally, and I think it is simply, as Simon said, a number of days of a very, very um, busy year that they now become true ambassadors, not only for their sport, for their sport, their sporting disciplines, but for their nation as a whole. Simon. Yeah, I agree totally. Um, I think, you know, athletes have been preferred to do stuff, especially go to Rio, it's a nice place. If you really want to go up and put my name in Elfus. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's imperative that we, you know, that, that you do give back. Um, I go into a lot of schools. I'm from Rochdale, just down the road, by the way, guys. I'm not, I'm not far from you a lot. And um, I go around the schools there all the time because, you know, I've had a great life out of sport. You know, I've, I've travelled around the world. I've been to things that you'd never go to unless I did sport. And I appreciate where I come from and I'll never forget where I come from. So, I, you know, I go into schools and I, I try and inspire people. And I think that we should be doing that within our own country. And I think the Brazilians will be really happy to to have stories from Olympians and Paralympians from the 2012 Games because most Olympians and Paralympians say it is the biggest one that they've ever been to. So I think you know Rio want to emulate what we've done, and I think you know they'll be all the better if we went over there and, and you know sort of betrayed our experiences to them. And by the way, don't forget we're expecting a medal hall compatible to 2012 and 2016. A lot of them pre-training, and we had a number of mm -hmm. well, we had competitors from all over the world pre-training in this country. I think it's one of the great opportunities that was built, that should have been built on further, of how we can enhance community life and the diverse representation of life we have in our communities. But there was an amazing interaction. I know I was in London at a conference and I shared a platform with um, the chief executive of the Trafford Leisure Trust and he spoke about the judo delegation of Brazil. One of the issues in that area is teenage pregnancy and it also is in Vanuatu. So we were able to share well beyond the sporting arena about cultural and human issues that we can benefit each other with as well. That's very clear and thank you. We come now to another question also from Valbank School, Sixth Form College. Maisie Gator. Where's Maisie? This is addressed to all of the panel as well. Um, how do you intend to ensure that young people who did not watch the Olympics and Paralympics become involved in their legacy? Okay, Simon. Yeah, well, I want to stand up again, don't I say that? Um, I think the best way to inspire people who have not watched the Olympics and Paralympics is word of mouth. Um, I run my own judo club in Rochdale, and we've, well, I run it with my mother actually, I better informed because I'm going home with her after she'll bat me on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> and the influx of kids since the Paralympics is, and the Olympics is immense, and it's just word of mouth, and people 
feel good when they're doing sport. And if you can get yourselves a club or go to a club and you feel good about it, tell people. Don't keep it to yourself, spread the word. It's not like a closed shop where you have to keep it a secret. Yeah, I tell all my kids, it's more to tell people how good this sport is. Because that's the only way, if you've not seen it, you can't make somebody sit down and watch the Olympics and Paralympics. But Britain at the moment has got a feel good factor about it. Everyone feels good about sport. You know, we're all sat here, we're all talking how good sport is, how much it's going to benefit you. And that is, is increasing because of the Olympics and Paralympics. And I think that we need to spread the word. You all like sport here, don't you? Yeah? yeah? Everyone likes sport, don't they? Yeah? Go on, just noise your because I can't see very well. So you don't know that. Right, you've got to talk. Okay? Okay? But right, you can laugh. I'm not going to be offended. You're right, right. So, if you like sport, tell that's better. If you like sport, you always get a couple on the front, don't you? Yeah. Usually it's on the back. If you like sport, tell people about it. That's what it's all about. Communication is what it's all about. If you keep it to yourself, how are people going to find out about it? You know, I love sport. I tell people I love sport. They tell the friends that I love sport, and, it, and it, it just that's how it happens. And we need to keep this feel good factor going. And like I said, if you go to a sports club and you enjoy what you do. Tell people about it because they'll be interested and they'll come along and have a go. That's how everything grows. Right, well, Clement Attlee, who was once Prime Minister, said democracy is government by discussion, but it only works if people know when to stop talking. <laughs> and this is not the case to stop talking, but although. Maisie suggested that the question was intended for the whole panel. I'm very keen that we get to all the questions. And we've had, if I may say so, such a magnificently clear answer to that question from Simon that I'm going, unless there's a revolt from the panel, to suggest that we move on to the next question, which is from Gemma Wagstaff of the Oasis Academy. Gemma. How can we ensure that all sports, including minority sports, are supported at grassroots level? And who wants to take that one on? I'll take that. Yes, please, Jeanette. I think EU departments in schools all over the country can play a massive role in this. Because traditionally, we have um, done hockey and netball and a few other sports that have become traditional. And certainly, in the P departments in our area, we've been trying to diversify to let students try a range of sports, some of them suggested by them, and some of them they've seen on the Olympics or the Paralympics. And in actual fact, the thing that's caused the biggest excitement at Malbank has been wheelchair basketball and um, seated volleyball. And our students now cry out to do that kind of thing during their PE lessons rather than the traditional things. And if we adopted the, exactly that policy with minority sports as well, we'd probably get far fewer kids bringing notes or lack of kit, saying they don't want to do PE, because they'd actually look forward to it because it's different. So I think that starts in the schools. Thank you. Right, we had an answer, well, we had a question raised earlier, which in a sense I made a stab at answering about there being lots of great sports clubs and activities, but nowhere for clubs to meet or coaches to train and so on. And I did say to you, if there's one idea, use your MP, get your MP on board, have that MP working for you, with you as a school and with the local authority to try to deliver the facilities you need. How about a, the question from Tom Smith of Walkden High School? It's quite an important question about North South. Um, Tom. How can we ensure the legacy of the Paralympics and Olympics reach the young people of the North? How can we make sure that the legacy of the Olympics and the Paralympics remains as strong here in the North as in the South of England? Well, go on, Martin, you have a go. Um, well, for, 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 first of all, of course, the, 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 um, the Olympics and the Paralympics belong to the North as much as they belong to the South, and they're being great uh, sportsmen and women from the South. And I think we've, 
we've got to have more events like this, more opportunities like this, where we can uh, create an opportunity for people to come and speak to us so that these games and their legacy rem remain alive. Um, we've got to work at it and take ownership of it. No one's just going to give it to us in that sense. And there's a very strong message from the North, which is as much part of England as the South. We feel strongly about that here in the North. And I think we've just got to keep driving that point home. And we've got to get more of you Londoners uh, to come up here and see what great people there are in the North and spend your time committing yourself um, to come to places like Salford and, um, and, and learn what people think. Okay. I think that I'm going to suggest we go to Liam Carney of Body Psych. Is it pronounced Body Psych? Yeah. Okay, Liam, your question. Okay. Really, I'm following on from the questions that's already been asked and how we can build on the, the legacy of the Olympics to provide better opportunities in terms of lifestyle activity and sports opportunities for these young people outside of school. Outside of school. Outside of school. Outside of school. Yes. So you're not talking about the school curriculum as such. Absolutely. So you're not. Being active in lifestyle options and services outside of school. Outside of school. Okay. Jeff. The 2012 Local Organising Committee, as part of the legacy commitment, sought to improve, by way of health and active lifestyle participation, 2 million children and young people in this country. It was a target that was removed a year into the Games, as it was felt it was unrealistic. I think it is absolutely first principle a requirement with the health benefits and active lifestyle benefits that with the Department of Health highlighting so many areas of where the youth time bomb in health terms is actually reduced by way of the ailments they are being able to reflect as a result of a sedentary lifestyle without sport or active lifestyle activity is that this is one of the key areas I believe we should be taking forward as part of a truly collective effort that will see public, private sector, local authorities, education, and above all, the health ministries really driving this forward. I know that the health um, policies have been radically amended. There's a lot of shift and change. But I do know that there have already been representations made by sport to the health department. And again, this is where democracy is required. This is where campaigning is required of both local MPs and writing to departments in order to make sure it does not slip off the in tray. But it is absolutely, in my view, the first principle that health participation, active lifestyle. There are issues about the community safety issues of which I've been challenged, but I think as a collective effort, we can actually start to get some major movement and participation levels that would please everybody. Who wants to come in on the back of that? Does anybody want to add? I think, uh, um, adding to what Jeff said, community organisations are hugely important. And uh, we've tended to lose sight of the importance of community organisations. Um, but there's some great ones around here, Broughton Trust, CD Langworthy Trust, uh, youth clubs, faith-based organisations that can actually uh, enhance and support that. Uh, we're putting a lot of work at this university into trying to build those connections. And I think they're really important for keeping that sort of legacy going, as you asked in the question, outside of schools. OK. Simon? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I work at a pupil referral service um, for kids who've been excluded from school. Um, so it's very difficult to get them involved in, in activities after school. But if you can get them there, I think it's a coach's responsibility as well to make it dynamic. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of young people in the audience tonight, and, and today, sorry, and if you go to a sports club, you want the coach to, to make it interesting for you. Because you've been to school all day, and you've been learning. At school, and when you go somewhere at night, you want to enjoy yourself. Yeah, you want it to be, you know, my judo club, but all the kids smile and they have a laugh and it's not serious. So I think it's a massive coach's responsibility to make it very dynamic. We live in a society where young people switch a, a PlayStation on. Is it still a PlayStation? I'm a very old. Is it still a PlayStation? It is, right, okay. You switch a PlayStation on and it's there straight away. You're playing straight away, you're in the action straight away. So when you go to these, when you go to a sports club, if, if somebody turns up my judo club, I will have them on the mat fighting within 10 minutes. I don't want to sit there and talk to them about rules and regulations for an hour because they'll go play football. 
or something else. So you've got to make it dynamic. So it is a, it's not just a, a thing about having uh, the money to get people in. When you get them in, you've got to keep them. And you've got to make it dynamic and you've got to make it snappy. You know, life is very fast these days. You have to, you have to treat uh, the sport the same way that life is. People get, I've got an attention span of a goldfish these days. Yeah, so you have to keep them very interested. So we have to retrain the coaches now in a modern day coaching style. Okay. <clears throat> I think you need to target 14 to 19 year olds as well. Because in the research that we've done, um, when asked have the games inspired you to try a new sport, many, many of our year seven, eight, nine students said yes. When year 10 and 11 students were asked exactly the same question, very, very few of them have. And I think partly that's the local, that is the problem of local sports club. I'm a member of a local sports club, I too play tennis. And I find that when teenagers come to my club, sometimes the older members of my club concentrate more on whether they're wearing the right attire and whether they're walking across the back of the court because they know that they don't know that's not acceptable than whether they're actually playing and then they only become interested in the potential elite tennis players that could join the club's teams and if you're really good at the club then you're accepted if you just want to go and have a laugh and play they get less of a welcome and that bothers me as a member of that club and I think that's replicated at lots of local sports clubs all over the country. Yeah, that's, a very, that's a very powerful point because we're trying to maximise numbers and mm. yeah. so take up. Mass participation, yeah. not elite not participation. Elite. I wonder if I can turn to the next question which is from Matthew Robinson of Albion High School. This one's for the old panel. Um, how can you help young people get involved in a range of sports and not just mainstream ones? Ah, that's different from the question I had here. <laughs> True. Okay, a range of sports, not just the mainstream ones. How can we help in that respect? Well, yes. It's about schools starting with a diverse PE curriculum and then building on that with an even more diverse extracurricular provision, which links into as many local clubs as possible that offers free participation to young people and genuinely welcomes them. I think schools can play a big part though, because it, it, it is, I don't know what, what your school's like, but where I do my judo club um, is in a school, and it's quite expensive to hire a hall. So we have to charge the kids because you know, I, I do enjoy teaching judo, but I don't want to fund it myself. <laughs> you know, and I think you know there needs to be sort of working between schools and external, you know, partners to come in because you know you, you're paying thirty pound an hour for a hall. You have to you have to get that money back somehow. So you have to charge the kids, and then you're alienating the kids who can't afford it. And I think you know it is all about mass participation, isn't it? You know, and if, if you don't give these these kids a chance who can't afford to come, you know. You've lost a, a, a massive majority, you know, a, a, a massive amount of people that you can get through the door. Yeah. The absolute first principle is being able to have access. That is the sport for all principle that I certainly benefited Simon and others. Today, that is not the case, either by price or by elitism. There are young people on the streets, nothing to do, and in my view, whilst having an unbelievably forgettable, this summer, last summer, we saw the evidence of that. I spoke to many young people who then said as part of our legacy manifesto, why can't we have free access to sports clubs and facilities like we can have free access to museums? And we decided that should be a major campaign by which we would have to make a significant argument by way of the resource implications, but above all, the benefits it could have to young people in the way that or areas that we've already discussed. And it is something we still need to look at. It is something that still needs to be campaigned for and fought for because these things are never given. There are far greater priorities of, of state at this time and I think it is an issue that still has to be addressed. But in my view, if we can get them off the streets and give them somewhere to go, then you give them something to do and then there's someone to show them that actually does have the language, the energy and the ability because you have far more choice than we ever had. 
So the traditional sports are no longer just applicable and the governing bodies need to be recognised in a far more reflective way what you're also interested in, whereas parkour in the centre of Manchester, a group of young people who are now the urban gymnasts of the streets. That's their first starting point to what could then lead to the performance level of excellence that we saw historically performed by our gymnasts in these games. So it's more flexibility and I think more um, creative policy thinking by the sports administrators. This idea, if I may say so, that we should all try to put something back, you know, is a very important one that Simon focused on at the start. And, you know, through some of the answers to these questions, there arises this whole question of how you make a thing accessible, at least in part by making it convenient, and at least in part by making it affordable. You know, and in my sport, I note entirely, and I identify with what Jeanette said about the attitude of some members of tennis clubs and so on, a rather a snooty attitude to people who aren't the best and so on. But there's also the issue of price. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine, quite a level-headed person a few weeks ago, and because I know she's a tennis enthusiast, and she said to me, oh, she didn't think there was much of a problem. I won't, I won't name her, she's not a public figure. But she said, oh, I don't think there's much of a problem, John. You know, how much does it cost to hire a court? And I said, well, public court near to where I work in Westminster is seven pounds an hour. And she said she didn't think that was much. And I said, well, you know, it isn't for you, because you earn 150,000 a year. <laughs> it isn't for you much, but, you know, for somebody on a modest income, that's a lot of money out of the budget. So, you know, I think that's a big deal. You were going to ask, what's the relevance of the Olympics to young people in Salford, most of whom have no first-hand experience of the Games? Well, I mean, I think the panel, in a sense, have explained all along, or made the argument that, by widening awareness and widening opportunity, it could be you, yeah. or it could be your child, or your grandchild. And of course, it's not just the, the chance to star and excel at the sports in the way that the Olympians have done. It's also perhaps a question of learning something about the values of the people who've done it. So in other words, even if you don't become an Olympic hero, if you watch and you enjoy, you might sort of think, well, what is it that I particularly admire? Not just the fact that they were so skilled, but maybe the fact that they were brave, or maybe the fact that they worked incredibly hard, or maybe the fact that they came from behind to win. It's something I've always admired in sport. I've always admired in all sports great comebacks. And I always say to people, it's never over until the whistle blows. It's never over until it's over. You might be down 5-0 in a football match, and you could come back and win. And history is littered with examples of that. So, you know, that, that's the thing about never say die. Don't give in. And can we come to what I think is the last question from Caitlin Lancaster of Rose Hill Primary School? Following the, su following the success of cycling in the Olympics, we want to know what provision will be made for safe places to cycle in urban areas such as Salford. Safe yeah, following the success of the cycling in the Olympics, what provision can be made for safe places to cycle in urban areas such as Salford? Martin is champing at the no, bit, no. colleagues. He wants to answer this question. We must not deny him his opportunities. We've, we've talked a lot about, uh, with uh, Mr. Speaker here, about parliamentary politics, but a lot of you <coughs> might not realise you also have local councillors. Um, and it's also very important that local councillors are elected and made to do their jobs. So the first thing that you should do is to find out who your local councillor is and get hold of your local councillor who will be very, very pleased to hear from you because most local councillors get ignored by their constituents. Um, and you should um, tell them what your needs are for, um, for cycling. And if you're not satisfied with the answer that you get from your local councillor, then here in Salford we now have an elected mayor. Uh, Ian Stewart, who used to be a member of Parliament and now is the elected Mayor of Salford. And if you're not happy with the answer you get from your local councillor, you should get hold of your elected Mayor and you should tell him that you want safe uh, uh, cycling. It is very important. I think a lot's being done in the city uh, to drive this forward. But uh, if you're a cyclist and you think that you're not safe, get hold of your local councillor and your elected Mayor. Well, there you are, students. You, know, you learn something new every day. I, I knew Comrade Stewart. <laughs> he was a member of Parliament until the last session. I didn't know he'd become the mayor. Congratulations to him. Uh, he's a very public spirited guy. So, who else wants to come in? Does anyone else want to come in on that one? No, I'll say it, not really. No. 
this is the point at which I think we can wind up. Okay, well look, thanks guys for taking part. By the way, I'd just like to, to finish by saying that what Martin has just underlined, the importance of approaching your local councillor, so sort of underlines a wider point, which is that it may not always seem this way, but actually your elected representatives are there to serve you. They aren't there, first and foremost, to serve themselves. They're there to serve you. And I don't want to make a controversial point, but some of the older people, and sadly the students here won't know this person, but some of the older people here will know of a very elderly, retired British politician called Tony Benn, who's now in his sort of 80s, late 80s. And he's got quite an amusing accent. He's got quite a, an amusing speaking style. He's a very good speaker. Careful, Mr. Speaker, he comes from my part of the world. He comes from your part of the world, does he? Right, okay. He's a very articulate speaker. Anyway, Tony, very he's what we call charismatic. Some people love him, used to love him, and some people hated him, but he's a very charismatic public speaker. And Tony Benn always says, you know, whenever I meet anybody with power, I always ask him five questions. What power have you got? Who gave it to you? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how can we get rid of you? <laughs> now, that's what you should always remember. Those councillors, those MPs, are there to serve you. So don't be shy, don't be embarrassed. Don't hesitate about approaching them, writing to them, sending them a me email, finding out that there's a phone number you can get them on, or just turning up at their surgery or whatever, and asking for help, because that's the point about democracy. The people you elect are there to do what you want. If you don't think much of their performance, you can always vote for someone else. So I hope you will actually engage with the process. But I think we owe a big vote of thanks to all who've made today possible. And I would like to thank a really rather inspiring example of Jeff and Janice. They're great people and the other members of the panel. Thank you. But I can tell that Jeff wants to get on his hind legs and it's not for me to stop it. wish to get up as the old limbs are far too sore, so um, excuse me as I try and loosen off. Um, sport is very good for you, although I would say anything in excess can equally provide you with a few reminders of too much is not too good for you. Um, today was a very important day, a very important milestone. Um, a legacy is not just about the day after, it's a long journey of so many people's efforts. And I think Manchester's 2002 Commonwealth Games legacy contributed to the 2012 securing of those games in London. Lord Sebastian Coe credited those remarkable games. It was at those games that the legacy of the youth charters work was to work with communities throughout the country, with Simon Jackson as a youth charter ambassador, and 240 signatories of the scroll, we attempted to do just that. There were immense challenges because I was rather naive into thinking that everybody would embrace the legacy. And it became one of the greatest fights of my life when I realized I was going to have to make far more representations than I would have ever thought was required. With that comes frustration. With that comes much anger. But as my martial arts and my good wife would remind me, patience is golden. All I can say to you is what I wanted to hope you achieve today with the 2012 Games, providing another inspiration of a generation that it had come from the inspiration of a lost generation, of young lives lost on the streets of Moss Side and other communities. And even in London, with only days of the Games, a 14-year-old schoolboy was to use his life in the capital. He will not see whatever that inspiration might be. But first and foremost, sport must be a vaccine. For those of you who are at school, stay at school. Embrace the opportunities that as Jeanette has found and has shared with her pupils at Mad Bank, who I've had the privilege to visit. And so many schools were able to share other countries where education is not a given. It's not even a provided opportunity. But more importantly, sport must remain at the heart of school life and community life. Our Legacy Manifesto was launched a year into the games. I'm hoping it will be the legacy of effort that sees with you attending today a relationship of us raising our bar. My thanks is to my panel. Simon is one of those special individuals. 
He makes things happen. He came on the streets with me, along with Sarah Storm as a Paralympian, when there were other sports people who started to ask me to engage with agents and managers. They'd forgotten where they'd come from. And we were losing lives on the streets. Those who were no longer went to school. And I kept going with the support of a few. And Simon, thank you. Professor Martin Moore reflected my South African experience in that of the youth charters. When people were asking what we were doing, we were being busy delivering on the legacy pledges of 2002. And Martin Moore and I struck up a rapport that sees us here today. And the hosting of such a wonderful world class facility cannot be underestimated. And Martin, thank you. Jeanette's a kid with scribbles. I mourn the lives lost, the lives that will never have an education. I've watched too many lives. To give respect to all of those lives, I cannot even remember them. I've been in the prisons, I've been to the graveyards, I've been to the secure units, and the approved schools, and quite frankly, I cannot believe this is the nation I was born in could have represented and one medal still. It cannot be right that we not have sport for all, but as the 2012 games have decided, the inspiration of the generation must be all young people from all backgrounds and all identities. The speaker's coat of arms is equality for all. I'd like to see a legacy for all. I want to thank you all for contributing. This will not be the end, it is simply the beginning. But you must use your democratic right, your voice, your energy, and your effort. The international year of peace is not just about conflict in the developing world, it's about the conflict on our streets as well. It is the conflict that has taken two WPCs and already the first young life in what is a post-game scenario. So please bear in mind, it will take all of your effort, all of your energy, and the final contribution to this effort will now be read out by Ben O'Sue, Youth Charter Ambassador. But more importantly, is our philosophy. Um, so as Jeff said, my name is Ben O'Sue. Um, I'm from London, so I'm not sure Arsenal, Liverpool, Manchester, I'm not sure how that all works. Um, but I'm honoured to be asked, or to have been asked to read out this philosophy on behalf of you, Charter, so here goes. Sport is a order of chivalry, a code of ethics and aesthetics, recruiting its members from all classes and all peoples. Sport is a truce in an era of antagonism and conflict, it is the respite of the gods in which the fair competition ends in respect and friendship, Olympism. Sport is education, the truest form of education, that of character. Sport is culture because it enhances life and most importantly does so for those who usually have the least opportunity to feast on it. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Let's see. Oh.